How did you run your businesses? My dad taught me to be as low key as possible. I always tried to hold costs down, which wasn't very popular with, with some of the young guys. And I always thought if I was one of them, most important thing to me would be how much money I walked out the door with at the end of the year. So um, that was always my priority. I mean, literally, we would have you know folding tables from Office Depot and and chairs, and you know, it's it was nothing fancy. Um, and we spent most of our time on training and on um, you know the, the model at Hanley Group was interesting because I let everybody trade their own account, and uh, I didn't look at the risk aggregated for years. You know, it was like when uh, Chernobyl hit. I figured out if you change the volatility, um, there's a thing called the Delta Vega that I didn't know anything about. And I learned it on the front lines live that um, we closed limit up that day and I was short um, 300 contracts. So whatever that is, a million and a half bushels of soybeans. And they, right when uh, first day Chernobyl got released, I didn't even know I was short. The market was closed. When did you move on from the Hanley Group? In 2009, because I had a falling out with my protégés at Infinium, they had forced me out. I decided I was going to build my own electronic trading firm. What a horrible time to do that Um, because 08 just cleaned everybody out. All the customers were were gone. But Bill Flourish, who was a dear friend of mine over at O'Connor, where I was clearing introduced me to a guy, uh, Mike Ortiz, that was trading OTC options for, for Fortis, cleaning up their book um, in London. And so I started an OTC options, exotic options, market-making operation in 2009. Our biggest customer was um, FC Stone. FC Stone came along and they bought Hanley Group in 2010. So I sold Hanley Group. They were a publicly traded company. It's called INTL, FC Stone. It's called StoneX now. I built out their, their OTC trading platform. We had all the, the, the risk systems. We had the trading expertise. Um, and I basically ran global trading for them from 2010 till 2013. And Sean O'Connor and Scott Branch were the CEO and CFO of, of FC Stone, of, or of INTL FC Stone. And um, I can tell you, just some class act guys. So I was done with them in 2013. You basically left behind um, all my people, in a sense, that I had brought into the business for years and my systems. And I fell into commercial real estate with some young guys. That, And then I was bought out of Infinium in 2012, that's when I exited the trading business. When did you start the George Hanley Foundation? I had a friend, John Ritten, from Minneapolis. He was at the Merck. He's a neighbor of mine in the village of golf. And he was involved at St. Sabina's, um, which was tied into OLPH, uh, the Catholic Church in Glenview. And so I set up um, scholarships for kids at uh, St. Sabina's grade school for families that were having trouble getting you know, paying the tuition and getting to high school because it was some incredible percentage of kids that graduated St. Sabina's, like almost 100% would graduate high school. There was just something that felt really good to me. You know, I always got involved with the Chicago Food Depository and stuff like that. But I officially set up the foundation in, um, I think it was 1992. That's been really one of the most fulfilling parts of my life. You know, my Irish and was raised Catholic, and we have a little guilt, us Irish. And um, I always kind of wondered why things happen the way they happen with me. And uh, I figured, I, you know, because it was, it was ended up being extremely successful uh, in my, um, and, you know, I think of just why me, so to speak, and figured it out one day, and it's because... My purpose in this life is is that I've received all these blessings, financial blessings, and that it's now my job to nurture and grow those blessings and then to give them back to the community. And to me, that's it's just, you know, it's like the circle of life. 
think it fits with my upbringing. Um, I think it fits with just what feels right to me. I've been involved with some great nonprofits. I, I'm, I'm, you know, mainly we give to colleges, you know, the, the trading, now to ESG Investing Center at the University of Dayton and the Sustainability Institute at the University of Dayton. You know, Dayton may become the first fully powered, fully green powered university in the world. And I think the sustainability, the sustainability, Hanley Sustainability Institute has a lot to do with that. And then my latest gift uh, to create a democracy center at the University of Miami. Um, you know, I started to negotiate that gift before January 6th. And just now, spending more time down here in the Miami area, um, just wanting to establish myself philanthropically down here. And again, I just, I love working with college kids and um, to tap into the infrastructure of you know, the University of Miami or University of Dayton. Um, I think it's just very good value um, for my foundation dollars. How did you know electronic trading was coming? I mean, the thing that really made a difference for me was I got appointed to the technology committee at the, at the, at the Board of Trade back in 1994, 1995. And you could just see what was coming. So I had lived in Lausanne, Switzerland, um, and had started, tried to start a little electronic trading operation, trading Sofix equity options back in 1993. And, um, you know, I knew electronic trading was coming and I tried to get, you know, I, I tried to get a foothold in, in London with the guy that I admire the most in the business is Don Wilson. Um, he's a little bit younger than me. And he's a much bigger appetite for risk than I do. He's really the number one guy that's come out of my era. You know, and we're so blessed to have been in the right place at the right time, you know, because how long did it really last? You know, from the Russian wheat deal, which was what, 72-ish to 08? I mean, that's only 36 years. And to have been born, you know, when I was born and just to be right in the heart of that, um, was just just a, all I can call it is a blessing, and um, to think that I mean I don't even know if I'd be here right now if I would have I'd have came out of school and been a great trader. I mean it was insane down there back then in the late seventies and eighties. Somebody had some bigger plans for me, I guess. What happened in the nineteen eighty eight bean market? Nineteen eighty eight was when we really thought we were going to see beans in the teens. Um, and there was a severe drought, and um, we were in the twelve dollars somewhere range. And um, it might have been Fourth of July weekend. It rained. It wasn't supposed to rain. And came in Tuesday morning, and um, beans were called limit down. Leading up to that weekend, as beans rallied, the puts, the fair value of our puts, because they were so small the paper was always paying over them. So we sold thousands and thousands of puts that were out of the money puts. And when you sell puts, um, you sell futures. And, you know, options are supposed to, you know, put in a call, Delta is supposed to add up to 100. But sometimes actually I figured out after 1988 what happened that it, it's, it's theoretically does, okay? <laughs> and... Um, um, and so Roger Griffin, who, you know, owned him and Tex Griffin owned Griffin uh, Trading, called me in and said, you know, George, $5 lower, my whole family is wiped out here. And I'm like, well, Roger, you know, we're not going to open at $7, just, you know. And he's like, well, you know, we, you got to do something here. And we were making so much money. I'm like, oh, no problem, Roger. We'll just start buying puts. So we started buying puts. And I started adjusting the sheets. And so we, do, we now went from short puts to long puts. So when you're long puts, the hedge is long futures. So you buy puts, you buy futures. So now this weekend comes and it rains. And beans are limit down, 30 cents lower. But the spot month is a dollar and like 20 cents lower. So we have to run our theoreticals a dollar 20 lower. And 
what happened was the volatility collapsed. And so now you're really just long futures. And I went into Roger and Tex and said, okay, guys, we got a problem here. We're long a thousand futures. Okay. And they're like, well, no, we have it right here. You're, you're only long like 50 futures. I said, no, guys, the market is not 30 cents lower after today. It's a dollar and, and 10 cents lower. And this is what you have to look at. And I might, you know, I just want to give you guys a heads up, but we're going to lose millions of dollars in, in the Hanley accounts tomorrow. So the market opened up the next day, limit down. The next day, I think, limit down. And um, you know, we ended up losing about five, six million dollars altogether. But that was that was probably the worst loss. You know, back then, five, six million dollars, 1988, that was real money, you know. But if I would have stuck to the position that the market had put me in naturally, you know, because eventually, you know, at the end of the day, as a market maker, you're a contrarian trader. Okay. And contrarian traders usually win as long as you can hold on. And so if I would have had that original short puts position, we wouldn't have lost five or six million dollars. We would have made five or six million dollars the other way. So literally it was like a 10, 12 million dollar swing. You know, back then we were a big seller of premium. You know, every government report was just a freaking disaster. I mean, all the money we made for weeks, we would just lose usually on the opening because we'd be so short premium. So over the years, we started to adjust and, um, you know, selling premium, you know, after all the big boys started to get involved in um, in grain options, the premium came down literally 25 to 50% just naturally. Really, Hanley Group was the big seller and, uh, and we did well because we were selling something that was really out of line. Um, but we only had so much capital. And um, you know, I liked the people that I cleared through, so I didn't really want to put them out of business uh, along with myself. You know, we were in, in it together at some level. But um, you, did, you learned that trading too big didn't pay off and that you had to have the size of position that you emotionally could handle. And what, you know, and what I did is I broke up the positions across a whole bunch of traders. I think I had 12, 14 guys in the soybean option pit at one time. So I had 14 different guys trading a smaller position. When you put that position together, it was unmanageable, but, but, but segregating it out made it manageable. Mm -hmm. So the, the rule at the end of the day is just don't trade too big, especially yeah. when you're selling premium. You know, I always thought the guys that were long premium, that was for wussies, you know, because the market went up, you got long, the market went down, you got short. You know, to me, it was way more challenging. Um, I love a challenge. Just the market goes up and you get short and the market goes down and you get long. And it's like, okay, now let's see what you're made of. Yeah. But you collect the theta, you know, you got paid for that stress. Um, I'd, like to, I'd like to donate some of that theta back and have a little less stress. <laughs> As I look back, but um, it was definitely learning on the front lines in a you know, live ammo situation back then. Who had the best year trading at Hanley Group? Brendan Cashman, um, you know, Tom Cashman's son. He had the best year ever in 2008. He was, he was along the tiny puts. I think they were August puts. Yeah, and eventually it rained and eventually beans broke. And, um, you know, and he had, you know, his dad was the, you know, filled orders, but his dad was a speculator at heart. And, um, you know, and Brendan has a little bit of that with, you know, in him. And, um, um, you know, Brendan worked harder than any of the other traders ever of any of any of my traders um, in 2008 when the market broke. What made Hanley Group successful? Because it was so hard for me to, to, to make it. And, um, you know, having gone broke those three times, that when I started to make it, I really had a lot of respect for it and humility I had. And, you know, and then you add in just what my, my family, what my father taught us, that you don't flash your money around, okay? You, it's, you, you stay low key. I think it was a combination of that. And I'll forever be thankful to my, to my dad and my, my mom and you know, my family for that.